<laughs> the beginning of class. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's future homework. Let's see. It's cooking. Um, all right, so let's assume that you know you have Python files out there, but you're not sure you know what the name was or something like that. So what we're gonna do is go ahead and type in ls, then put a space. All right, then put, um, let's just do, put an asterisk. Uh, shift wait. eight, shift eight, the little star. Dot py. All right, and press enter now. This will show you all files that start with anything and end with a .py. Okay. All right, so if you had 3,000 files in there and you had three of them that had Python in it, .py in yeah. it, it would just show you those three. All right, so all right. this is kind of our skills of getting through the, the, the directory system. Um, and if you remember from last time, I also said you can kind of drag the file in there to get you the full path to it. That's another way. But any way you cut it, you want to move into the directory where if you type in ls, you see your file. So right now we're sitting in the directory where we see our hello.py, right? Yep. All right. So now to run it, we're going to call, we're going to run an application. We're going to call the Python interpreter. So you're going to type in Python 3. Misspelled it. P Y T H. Then the number three, space, um, hello P Y. And you could probably just type in capital H E and press tab. It is case sensitive. So do go ahead and hit the up arrow. Hit the hit the up arrow once. Okay, so that reloads it. Backspace twice to get back to the beginning of the E H. Tab, I'm getting that little. Uh, just press delete. Delete. And press it again. Mm. Nope. We need to start with a capital H. The name of your file is hello with a capital H. Three. All right. There you go. Press enter. All right. And there's your file. There's your executed file. Oh. That's... So, so I actually ran the program. So now, I could have... Um... Could I have gone do to do, do put these all away? Um wow, I have a lot of things open. Uh could I have just dragged it in? Yes, but you have to run the file. So go ahead and open so leave that window where you have it. Yep, there we go. So now let me I'm gonna show you what to do. So go into your terminal. Okay. Um, and actually, just so we can kind of see this reboot, why don't you just type in CD and press enter. Okay, this will take you back to your home directory. So if you type in PWD right now, you're back in your home directory. Yep. Okay, so that means that your hello.py is not currently in this directory. All right, okay. so go ahead and actually, if you want to see how to prove that, press the up arrow a couple times to get back to that Python 3, uh, that guy, press enter. Now it'll scream at you saying, hey, I can't find this file, blah, blah, blah. All yeah. right, so go ahead and now type in Python 3 and then put a space. All right, now drag your file into that directory, into that uh, terminal, just anywhere in the terminal. So notice it gave you the full path to that file. Yeah. Now you can press enter and it'll run it. Oh, that's... All right. Yeah, so it's not like you dra it's not like you drag the the file in there and it's running the file directly. When you drag a file into the terminal, it goes ahead and expands it to the full path where that file lives on your computer. Yes. Okay. So, yep. so you understand kind of our cadence now. So on one hand, you have to write your Python code somewhere, then you have to save it somewhere, <laughs> then we go out to the terminal and have to run you know our Python interpreter. Excuse me, a Python interpreter with that file. Okay. That makes sense? Yep. All right, so that's going to be our, our go-to move whenever we do uh, Python stuff. Um, and this is true of any programming language, really. I mean, any programming language you're programming in, you're going to write some code, you'll save it, then you run the file through whether it's an interpreter or the compiler. We'll talk about the differences between those things but uh, as we keep going through my slides. But... You know, that's the cadence of any programming language. Type it, save it, run it. <laughs> Make sense? Yep. 
Yep. Okay, so you've done that stuff. Now, I want to look. What were you supposed to get done for today? Because I know Vincent's going to ask me later. So I'm looking on your canvas. Were you just supposed to go through the Hello World stuff? Or was, there, I think so. or was there more stuff you were supposed to get done? Let's see. A good first program. So that was exercise one? A good first program. Okay. Looks okay then. All right. So then, do you have any questions about kind of where things are going or so far so good? I mean, um, it's a little concerning maybe that the book didn't connect you to that you had to run it like that. Um, yeah. So if you, if you, in the future, if you're doing homework and you run into a situation where you're not actually testing the code you wrote, uh, something's not right. <laughs> you definitely, you definitely want to have to test it at some point. Okay. Um, that makes sense. Otherwise, yeah. you're just writing stuff into a file and hoping it works, and that's never going to be a, a great idea. Yeah. Um, all right. So, do you have any questions about anything else? Do you want me to just keep trucking through my uh, slides? Let's just keep on going. All right. Let me share my screen then. I have to unshare. Yep. All right, so you can see this? Yep. All right. So, <clears throat> remember last time, I'll just kind of f flip through these real quick and, and just review them for, you know, the next 30 seconds. You know, we talked about what is programming. This is the idea of telling a computer what to do. Yep. You know, then we talked about how do humans actually solve problems just in general. Uh, we yep. use our memory, we ask questions, and we do repetition. Okay, and, and kind of my... Uh, my, my mentality here when I teach programming is this idea that human beings are really, really, really good problem solvers. We're so good that computer programming is hard for us because it's tough for us to dumb things down and actually explain how we solve problems. All right. It's not that computers are hard. It's that we're so good is the, is the punchline. All right. So whenever you run into issues programming, remember that. Remember that the stuff you're working on is trivial. It's just boring you. And you got to get yourself to slow down to, uh, to kind of figure out how it works. Yeah. All right. So what's the job of a programming language? Well, this gives the human being a convenient way of talking to the computer because we're speaking different languages. And yeah. I mentioned that 100% of programming languages have facilities for those three ways human beings solve problems. So every single programming language will have a way of emulating memory, usually through variables. They'll have yeah. a way of asking questions, usually through conditionals. And it'll have a way of emulating reputation, uh, repetition through loops and functions, this kind of stuff. Yep. All right. So then we drew this little picture here because I like drawing pictures. And we kind of talked about what's, uh, what is your computer. And we decided your computer is kind of this collection of your CPU, your, your RAM, your, the hard drive, and all that stuff lives on this motherboard that makes all those dudes talk to each other. And, you know, then what sits on top of that is our operating system that allows us to click on icons and things like that. Okay, and then we put the screen in there because that was your answer. Um, and ultimately, so you have the human being looking at the screen. And what are they looking at? They're looking at the operating system through the screen, which talks to the hardware, which actually makes things happen. Yep. All right, so there's a lot of layers here that make things nice and easy for humans because at, down at this level here, uh, things are just zeros and ones. Okay? Yep. So that took us into this guy. and We talked about... Um, you know, what is, uh, so this is kind of a, another view of that same thing. So computers speak zeros and ones. We speak English. There's got to be some magic in the middle for us to ultimately talk. Yes. So then we had this slide called There's Three Kinds of Programming Languages. Um, and this is kind of where we, we, we left off in these next two slides. So, you know, I mentioned that we have machine level. We have machine level language. We have low level language. We have high level language. And... Yep. In these guys, I talked about this one-to-one -one relationship and this one-to-many relationship with the CPU, and we were just starting to look at what that may means. So yeah. what we wanted to just explore here is what is the CPU? What is this guy actually? Yeah. All right, so when we look at a CPU, it stands for the central processing unit. People always say that first, right? 
It's always easiest to say what something is rather than how it works or what it does. Yep. All right. Um, we could say it's the brain of the computer. That's fair enough. I like to think of it as a big collection of magic tricks where each magic trick accomplishes some small task. And uh, what, a task yep. is a, what a, a task is a granular component of a larger problem. Um, so this is actually should be where a task. Where a task is a granular component of a larger problem. All right, and if you remember from last week, I, I kind of gave you that thing. If you hold your hand up and you move your thumb in and out, nobody's impressed by that, but that's a pretty important move that you use every single day to pick up a fork or grab a soda or whatever, right? You know, the, as a human, we have all these little tiny magic tricks that we can do that in and of themselves just make us look weird, okay? But when we put those together with other things, we move our finger, we move our thumb, we move our index finger, we move our wrist, we can accomplish a whole bunch of stuff that we take for granted, all right? But that's kind of like the magic tricks that a CPU does. Okay? Yep. So, let's start off with this machine level thing here. So, we'll just, now, now that we understand what this concept of a CPU is, a CPU is a collection of magic tricks. Okay? So, if we're talking right to the CPU, at the end of the day, we're speaking zeros and ones. That's not for humans. That's not going to be for us. We don't want to sit there with the little two-button keyboard tapping things out. Okay, that's that's not going to let us move on with the, we're, we're going to go crazy pretty quick. Now we do have programming languages called low level languages. Um, and uh, I'll just go ahead and give you kind of an example here. So these are sometimes called assembly language. Uh, like right now I'm teaching a course uh, that for programming the CPUs on smartphones. And that uses ARM processors. So we're writing ARM assembly. But you could also have Intel assembly. So at that point, you're really talking directly to the CPU, but you're using a low-level language, so it's going to kind of look like English, but every little every line of code will equal one magic trick on the CPU. All right. So this would be equivalent if you're telling me how to um, pick up a soda. I say that because I have a soda right next to me. <laughs> so if you tell me how to pick up a soda, you might tell me, okay, to extend my hand. To move my thumb down, you know, individual magic tricks is what you're telling me, right? Move yeah. my thumb down, bend my index finger, so on and so forth. That's going to get pretty tedious pretty quick, but it is something that human beings could do. Okay? So that's what a low-level language is. Now, a high-level language, these are power tools. This is a one-to-many relationship. So now we're able to kind of... Um, throw a whole bunch of stuff into a single line of code. You write one line of code in a high level language and a whole bunch of stuff is happening in the background. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is that one to many relationship. So this is, this is going to be languages like Python, Java, C++, so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to show you something cool. All right, give me a second here. I think this is the one I like using. I know you don't see what I'm seeing yet, but you will in a moment. <laughs> All <laughs> right. So I think I just shared the one application screen. I'm going to share my... I'm going to share my whole screen. All right, so you see what I'm looking at here? Yep. There's Linux. Okay. So what we're looking at here is, um, are, have you heard of Linux before? Yep. What is Linux? Linux is like an, another um, uh, uh, software. Okay. It's um, um, yeah, so, so Linux fits into the category of uh, this dude right here. That's what I was. Yeah. Oh, that's what I forgot. I was like. No, that's good. <laughs> That's fine. I've been saying these words longer than you have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Through repetition, this stuff will kick in. Don't worry about it. Yeah. I always want you, even if you think you might know it, I always want you to guess. Yep. Because we'll, we'll keep correcting those uh, little brain neurons and stuff like that because we're going to grow your neurons as mine are dying off. Is the, <laughs> is, is, is the plan. All right. So Linux is one of many operating systems. And actually, while we're at that, let's just demystify all this stuff. So I'm going to come down here and we're going to just talk about what an operating system is. Um, now, one thing that uh, uh, you're going to find as we go through this stuff. Uh, so, I mean, I'm a computer science professor, so I teach, you know, um, 
college level computer science, undergraduate and graduate courses. So, you know, lots and lots and lots of different stuff. So I teach all sorts of different classes. Now, one thing that's really interesting, though, is we have this idea of the grand ideas of computer science, where it doesn't matter what course I'm currently teaching, I might be talking about topics in there that I could just as easily be talking about in a different class through a little bit different lens. You know, so when we're dealing with computers, if I'm talking about, if I'm teaching an operating systems class versus I'm teaching a hardware class, in both of those classes, it's appropriate to talk about the operating system. We just might care about different aspects of the operating system. If I'm teaching a programming class, we might also be talking about the operating system, but we're talking about a different aspect of the operating system. All right, so the, all this stuff with technology is all important to understand how all these pieces talk to each other because that helps us become a better programmer. All right, so we're going to give a high level idea of what an operating system does here. So operating system sits between us and the computer so that we don't have to manipulate wires or something along those lines, right? Yep. You know, we don't want to have to turn little knobs and, you know, touch little pieces of metal to, to, to contact points and make, to make things happen. We'd like to tap on our keyboard and use the mouse and have the magic of double clicking do all this stuff for us. So the yep. operating system does that for us. Now, I'm going to draw another picture here because we've already seen, we've had a couple of pictures that are all showing kind of the same thing, but in a little bit different way, right? Yep. So I'm going to go ahead and draw our CPU again here. <clears throat> so there's the CPU. Mm -hmm. And there's our person. Here's our operating system. All right, so this is kind of a little uh, stack here. I actually want to do something. Let's make those guys a different color there. And let's actually make this guy that color. And we'll make this guy this color because it's nice to see different colors. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I was joking with my wife a little bit ago about finger painting, and I'm here making all these different things, different colors <laughs> as it is. So this is the digital version of finger painting, I suppose. All right, so as a person, we might not like it, but we could write a low-level program, right? We can write that one-to-one -one relationship with the CPU. And what we're going to look at here in a second is we're going to actually look at a low-level program, you know, kind of what, what could happen if, we, if somebody forced us to do it, all right? So we could write that low-level program here, and that low-level program is going to talk to the operating system. But it's actually talking to the operating system through a collection of system calls, called an API. Have you seen the, the letters API before? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you know what they know what they mean? No idea. Okay, so this is application and historically sometimes people would say abstract. But let's say application programming interface. Okay. Now you say, well, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> so what is this guy? This guy is a, this is a set of, I'm actually going to, sometimes you'll see people say a set of libraries or a set of functions. This is really a set of abilities that allow a program to talk to another program. And let me just give you a, a firm example of this that I think will 
kind of connect the dots. Let's say you're writing an application and you want to um, uh, accept payments with PayPal. Okay, yep. so you want you want somebody to be able to pay you pay you money through your app. Now you could either go and invent your own payment system, you know, figure out how to link to a bank and all this other stuff, or you could recognize that oh, you know what? There's a company out there named PayPal that's already done this, right? Yep. And they're experts. They're experts at the, the collecting money thing. So, so it might be nice to get PayPal functionality into your app. So you get payments by leveraging PayPal's expertise. Something like that. All right, so they already have a product that does exactly what you need it to do. You just need a way of getting that into your, uh, getting your application to use their tools. Yep. We use an API to accomplish this. So you would in, you would download PayPal's API into your program, and then you would write and you would get the API in our case here for like Python. PayPal has a Python version of their API where it would give you um, functions in Python that you could call upon to connect to PayPal and ask PayPal to do different things for you, like send money to somebody, receive money from somebody, check your balance, that kind of stuff. Yeah. That makes sense? Okay, yep. so that's what an API is generically, and we're going to talk about them in a little bit more detail here in a, in a, in a few minutes, but... Um, you know the the punchline is is this could be PayPal, this could be Google Maps, this could be almost anything. Okay, um, so we go back to this picture. So we have the person who's going to write the write the low level program that is going to run on the operating system, but that program and really we could even flip these two around. It's a little bit of a chicken or the egg type thing here. Okay, so when we write our low-level program, we're writing it in terms of the API that allows us to tell the operating system to do stuff. So in yep. this particular case, based on the example we just mentioned, the operating system, in this case Linux, is kind of like PayPal. Okay, so we have a bunch of functions that allow us to tell Linux to do something special for us that Linux already knows how to do. That make sense? Yep. All right. So I'm going to now show you. And ultimately, after we write the program that is implemented in terms of these system calls and tells the operating system to go, ultimately the CPU does some stuff, performs his little magic tricks to accomplish a task. So now let's look at an actual assembly language program. All right. So you wrote Hello World yep. in Python today, right? Uh, how long was Hello yep. World in Python? How many lines? Uh, just one. One line. One line in Python is uh, uh, is hello world. And just to drive this point home, that's our high level language. That's yep. a power tool. Okay. We know that that one little print statement in Python did a whole bunch of crap under the hood, right? Yep. All right. So now we're going to look at an actual assembly program. So this is hello world in assembly. And we're going to walk through this. I'm going to tell you what it's doing here in a minute. Okay, now first of all, it looks a little cryptic, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm telling you, and I'm gonna explain it in a minute, but this code here has hidden power tools inside of it. It could actually be a lot worse. Okay, if we had to write all of it ourselves, this might be hundreds of lines of code. Yeah. All right, so let's walk through this and see what's actually happening. So forget about these first two lines, this is just kind of header stuff, okay? This is where our program starts. So here's really the meat of our uh, code right here. All right, so then down here we have our data section. This is our variables. So I mentioned that all programming languages have the ability to emulate memory. Yep. So we're creating a couple of variables here. We're creating a variable called MSG and we're creating a variable called LEN. This is the message, this is the length of that message. So our message is hello world. Yep. And 
len will be the length of hello world this is the number of bytes long that hello world is so in this case this is three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen thirteen bytes long okay yep. don't worry about that for right now just this is the message this is the length of that message okay so we have two variables defined here in our data section now we go up here to our logic so this is our our code now in our cpus in our computers we have these things called hardware registers so just as i've said that all um, programming languages have facilities for uh, rem rem remembering stuff holding variables holding uh, values our processors themselves have these things called hardware registers which are little tiny chunks of memory that are really 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 fast that could hold a little bit of information and these yeah. guys are called EDX, ECX, EBX, EAX. There's like 32 of them or even 64 of them. Okay. Yeah. So we have four different little memory registers here that we're using. So this command right here, MOV, what do you think that does? Move. It moves some stuff. All right. That's what MOV does. It moves. So we're calling upon, a, remember, in a low-level language, every line of code has a one-to-one -one relationship with a magic trick on the CPU. So this instruction right here will do one thing on the CPU. It will tell the CPU to move something to a, dis to a destination. So the very first thing I'm doing is I am moving the length of my message into this memory location. Yep. Next thing I'm doing, I am moving the message itself into this memory location. The next thing I'm doing is I'm moving the number one, for some random reason, let's say, into this memory location. The next thing I'm doing is like moving the number four into this memory location. Yeah. So the first four things I've done here is all I've done is I've just moved some stuff into four little buckets. All yeah. right. So it's kind of like when you have to clean your room. You went in there, grabbed four things, threw them in their little homes, and then you're done. <laughs> and that's, that's, all, that's all that happens. Okay. So yeah. we saw what happened in the first two. These are pretty obvious. I put into EDX the length of the message. I put into ECX the message itself. Yep. All right. Now, EBX, when I put in a number one here, what this bucket is holding is where I want to write. Because ultimately, I'm printing out hello world, right? That's what this code is supposed to do. Yep. All right. So I'm putting a one in here because one is associated with this thing called standard out. So standard yep. output on a computer is the screen. All right. So I'm. this is going to say, where am I going to print it? I'm printing it to the screen, to standard output. All right, so to the first output stream. Yep. All right, and then I'm putting into EAX the number four. Well, what's the number four? The number four is related to the system call called syswrite. If we go back to our picture over here, we have these system call APIs. Yep. So inside here, there's some giant program that somebody wrote that's called syswrite. And that program does all the magic of taking something uh, from some, some memory locations, talking to your graphics card, which talks to the monitor, which ultimately gets certain lights to turn on and certain lights to turn off. It's doing a lot of stuff. That make yeah. sense? All right, so that, that one little word, this little cis right word here, does a lot. <laughs> All right, so this one little line right here um, is a little deceiving for us. So when we put a number four in here, we're kind of calling in a heavy hitter. We're calling one of our power tools in and saying, hey, I'm gonna need you over here in a minute, okay? So the yep. first four things we did is we just staged some, some values. We put four values in four different locations. Yep. Now we get to this guy right here. Do you know, uh, uh, so the, it's, the instruction is called int. Do you know what this guy stands for? You've probably seen the related word before. No. Uh... In programming languages, when you see int, you might think, oh, it's a number. We're storing an, an, an integer. Okay? But this is related to the operating system. This, this is, we're interrupting. This is called an interrupt. All right, so we're, we're interrupting something. And this guy right here, the 0x80, mm -hmm. this is the base memory address of where the Linux operating system resides in memory. Okay, so I'm saying I'm going to interrupt my computer and hand things over to Linux. That's what this is doing right there. So notice here it says call the kernel. The kernel is the um, actual operating system. So yep. for instance, right now you're on the Mac OS. 
Okay. Um, the Mac OS is actually a distribution. The operating uh, the operating its, uh, system itself is OpenBSD Unix, which is what uh, uh, Mac OS runs on top of. If you're on a Windows machine, you might say, "Oh, I'm running I'm running uh, Windows 10." Well, Windows 10 is a distribution. It it has an operating system as well as a whole bunch of applications that make that operating system fun to use. Okay, so the operating system itself is called um, and Windows is called the NT kernel. So the NT yeah. kernel is the actual operating system that Windows 10 is based on. Windows 10 itself is a distribution. This is kind of a semantics thing. Most people, if they're talking about operating systems, they reference them as Windows 10 or Mac OS or Linux. So I'm really getting into the technical term of things that nobody uses. <laughs> All right. Okay. But what's happening here is we are saying, okay, I have staged four values in some very specific places for some strange reason. Now, Linux, you take it from here. That's what that next line says. Yeah. And the very first thing Linux is going to do is it's going to go and it's going to look at EAX. And it's going to say, okay, what would you like me to accomplish? You want me to do my uh, power move number four called syswrite. Okay, well, what do I need for syswrite? I'm, I'm pretending to be Linux here. Okay, so yeah. you told me you want me to do syswrite. Well, what do I need to make syswrite work? Well, I need to know where I'm printing something. I need to know what I'm printing and I need to know how long it is. Okay, so I happen to know that EBX is where I'll go to look up where I'm going to print it. I know that ECX is where I'll go to look out what to look at what I'm printing, and I know that EDX is where I'll go to look at how long it is. So it was very important for us as the programmer to make sure we put these four pieces of information in these exact places. Right? If I put a different value inside of EBX, then all of a sudden the output might be something different or something illegal. If I put a, you know, a different value inside of ECX, now it doesn't know what message to print. So it's going to those very specific places to find, you know, to, to accomplish the task I'm asking it to do. All right. So I staged all this, all these values called upon Linux to go and perform this task for me. So ultimately it said, I'm going to print something. Where am I going to print it here? What am I going to print this guy? How long is it? This guy, boom. It goes and does it. So now, hello world's on the screen. All right. Then yeah. we've given control back to the program. Now, remember up here, we put into EAX a four. And that was associated with the system call syswrite. Now I'm overwriting what's in EAX with a one. This is another yeah. system call called sysexit. And then I'm interrupting again, telling the kernel to take over. So every single time we interrupt and tell the kernel to take over, it always goes and looks in EAX first to find out what you want it to do. So up here, you wanted, you, we wanted to do a sys write, which required three pieces of information. Down here, we wanted to do a sys exit, which doesn't require any inputs. The program just ended. Yep. All right. So this is a hello world program in Linux assembly. Kind, yep. of make, kind of makes sense how it's these little tiny little steps that all led up to something. Yeah. All right. So now after I walk through this, after I talked about how this worked, it, it, it's not all that bad, right? This made pretty reasonable sense. Yep. Okay. And this is something that you could write as a human being. But this really was quite a bit of, you know, let's say somewhat cryptic stuff to accomplish something so small, right? Yep. You really preferred just typing in print hello world. That was yeah. <laughs> that was a much much friendlier uh, experience. All right. So the, the the concept here is that a low level language like assembly can be done by humans, but isn't commonly done by humans because we like power tools that will do this for us. Okay. Yeah. All right. But that's where this whole system call is. So if we didn't have system calls, so if we go back to much older operating systems. You know, some of the earlier operating systems, we would not have been able to call upon the kernel to do this syswrite stuff. We would have had to have another five or six hundred lines of stuff in here to replace this one line to accomplish what we actually needed to do in terms of talking to the graphics card and talking to the monitor and serial ports and parallel ports and all this other stuff. Yeah. So it would have been worse before. 
<laughs> is, is what I'm getting at. All right. So, that's the slide dealing with there's three kinds of programming languages. Now, I'm going to create another slide that's similar to that one. There are two kinds of programming languages. We have interpreted and we have compiled. Okay, we have interpreted languages and we have compiled languages. Now, I'm going to talk about compiled languages first um, because that's directly related to what we just looked at. All right, yep. so compiled languages use a compiler to convert a high level language to a low level language. Yep. I'm going to go back and I'm going to draw something here real quick. So here's our three kinds of programming languages from before. We have machine level, low level, and high level. At the end of the day, our code, one way or another, has to get into machine code. Yep. I mean, it has to happen. Whether we wrote it directly or we have some tools that sit between us and the CPU that make it happen, it has to get down to machine code. We just saw low-level code where we're like, okay, yeah, if, if I had to, I could have written that. But yep. we really like the high-level code. You already told me you kind of like the whole Python print hello world. Well, so yep. now if we type something in a high-level program, we can then use a compiler, which will translate that into the equivalent low-level code. Yeah. All right? So that's what a compiler does. If we just create a separate slide thing here, give ourselves a picture version of this. So high level code. Yep. Goes through a compiler. Something like that. All right, so we write it in high-level code, we shove it into the compiler, the compiler spits out low-level code, and now it's almost ready for the CPU. Yeah. All right, so the CPU is still sitting over here. Still sitting over here, waiting for some zeros and ones. Somehow, right? Yeah. All right. So it's it's waiting for that guy in order to in order to accomplish its task. So so far we don't have the tool yet that takes us from low level code to zeros and ones, but um, that does exist. It's something called an assembler. Okay. Yep. But we don't need to worry about that because we're operating up at this level. Okay. Yep. So we're operating at this level, and we're going to use a tool kind of like a compiler. Alternatively, we can use something called an interpreter. So yep. an interpreter, an interpreted language, uh, uh, language uses an interpreter to convert a high level language to a low level language. So then we might say, okay, well, it sounds like an interpreter and a compiler both do the same thing. The short answer is sort of. The longer answer is, is that an interpreter interprets during runtime. So that is while the program is running. Whereas a compiler does the conversion prior to runtime before yeah. we run the program. All right, that type of thing. So what does this ultimately mean? This ultimately means that typically interpreted languages are relatively slow. Yeah. Compiled languages 
are relatively fast. Yep. All right. Now, the real reality is that our computers are really, really, really fast. And since our computers are really, really, really fast, for most applications, a human's not going to be able to see the difference between an interpreted and a compiled language. Yep. All right. We're not going to we're not going to feel that speed difference. Okay. Because all these things are happening at um, you know at, at time levels that we can't discern. We can't feel fractions of nanoseconds and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. But if you have an application that's doing something that's you know a big enough problem, some sort of big simulation or something like that where all those instructions add up to something that actually takes human noticeable time, you might have something that takes 10 seconds versus something that takes 30 seconds or 50 seconds or five minutes in an interpreted language. Then we'll start feeling the slow, slowness of it. Yep. Okay. So you don't want to really look at this as necessarily being a problem. You don't want to think of interpreted languages as being worse than compiled languages um, because there are actually pros and cons. So let's look at that. <clears throat> Interpreted versus compiled. All right. So we'll create our little thing here. So we already said interpreted is relatively slow. So that's one comparison, right? Yep. Compiled is relatively fast. Now, interpreters, that is the tool that converts from the high-level language to the low-level language, are easy, well, actually, let's just keep using the same phrase, are relatively easy to write. Yep. Compilers are relatively hard to write. Yep. Okay. Uh, we can even take that a step further and say they are even harder to write well. Because remember, your, high, your compiler has to take your, low, your, your high level computer programming code and turn it into what it hopes to be very efficient low level code on that CPU. Yeah. Right? Well, you'll, so we're going to see here pretty quick as we get farther and farther into programming that you can write two or three programs that all do the same thing in very in, in significantly different complexities. You can write a pretty efficient version of it. You can write a less efficient version of it. And you can write it in a horribly inefficient version, yet the output will all be the same. Yep. Okay? So if you technically have an accurate compiler that technically takes your high-level logic and turns it into equivalent... Um, functionally equivalent low low level logic that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best low level logic the most optimized low level logic you know you might be telling uh, the CPU to do all these magic tricks that are completely useless uh, you know kind of like if you were giving me the instructions on how to pick up the soda and you're having me do all this weird stuff before I actually just grab the soda and picked it and, and drank it right you know yeah. just because you thought it was funny you know <laughs> some something like that all right, so compilers are very, very, very complex. So if we're having to write that power tool, you know, if we want to create a, a high-level language that's going to run very quickly, it's reliant on us creating this really complex tool called a compiler, um, which not only ha does it have to create functionally equivalent uh, low-level code to the high-level code that was written, it would be ideal if it created um, optimized code as well. All right? So compilers are hard, is, is the punchline. So this, this, this speed comes with a cost of the compiler. Now, yep. an interpreter, this guy up here, these are pretty easy to write because they're typically written in other high-level languages um, yep. you know, that already have compilers written for them or something like that. All right. So what you typically see in today's, um, today's world of programming is um so let's call let's just write interpret it well i'm gonna do it this way first i'm gonna say compiled languages so i'm gonna list some compiled languages so we're gonna have c c plus plus java c sharp swift objective c 
All right, so you've probably seen most of these at some point. Objective C might be foreign to you. Um, have you seen Swift before? Have you heard of Swift before? Yep. Yeah, yeah, this is Apple's newest language. Okay. Yeah. And you've heard of C and C++. You don't necessarily know maybe how all these guys connect to each other, but punchline is is that C++ came from C, Java came from C++, C Sharp came from Java, Swift came from Java and C Sharp. So these guys are... They're cousins. <laughs> if you know how to read uh, one of them, you can pretty much read all of them. Every one of these languages are compiled languages. Yeah. Okay? And one thing you might keep in mind related to these languages is that they are all relatively old. Um, Swift is the youngest of all of these. You know, it's been out for like four, four years now. But uh, generally speaking, you do not see new compiled languages come out very often. And it's because compilers are hard to write. You know, yep. the compiler for C has been out for 50 years. All right, so this guy's been time tested. <laughs> it's, it's, had, it's got a couple of miles on him. All right, and the C compiler today is far more optimized than C compiler week one. All right, because it's had some years to kind of go through that. Similar to C++, similar to Java, so on and so forth. And we'll talk about the differences between these languages later, but right now... This is the lens we're looking through for the idea of compiled languages. Okay? So now, yeah. when we look at interpreted languages, and I'm just going to give you a little subset here because there are far, 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 far more interpreted languages than compiled languages because they're a yeah. lot easier to, um, to bring out. All right, so we talk, we talk about some, I'm going to go from like an older language to a newer language. So we have like Perl, PHP, uh, let's go Ruby, Python, um, what else do I want to put in here, you could say JavaScript, Node.js, this is a newer, Ajax, jQuery, we could just keep cooking for a while, you know. Basically, whenever a new, I would say once per every year, there's probably at least two interpreted languages that come out that are popular. And my gut feeling is probably another hundred that never catch on. Okay? So, yeah. interpreted languages are a dime a dozen, is what it comes down to, because they're, a mu they're much, much easier to, to come across. And it doesn't mean that they're bad. So I don't want us to create this, this idea that, oh, well, because uh, compiled languages are fast and interpreted languages are slow, um, compiled must be better. Well, one of the nice things about interpreted languages is when they come out, they're, they're often power tools for human beings to solve complex problems. We already have the luxury today that our computers are really fast. So since our computers are so fast today, we don't have to worry so much about the optimization of a compiler. Okay, because our computer today typically run is only sitting idle 95% of the time. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things I tell my students is if you're going out and buying a new computer, you know, uh, as a human being, we're, we're very greedy, right? So we always want the fastest processor. It's like, okay, well, I want the Core i7 quad core or six core that's running at 3.8 gigahertz, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Yeah. I usually tell people, get the fastest processor until there's a big jump up in price. Okay, so keep upgrading the processor in your computer. And, you know, when it's like 20 bucks up, 20 bucks up, 20 bucks up, and all of a sudden it's a $400 jump to the next one, don't, yeah. do, don't take that jump. Because, <laughs> you know, sit at the sit at the fastest that's still cheap. Then what do you do? You maximize your memory. So put lots of RAM in your computer. But the very, what do you think the, the most important part of your computer is for speed after memory? Um, after, like, after, uh. Like if you have a computer and your computer feels slow, um, uh, what's the right. first thing you can do to make it faster? RAM. Yeah, so like, RAM should probably be the first thing you ask. You say, do I have enough RAM? Because yeah. adding more RAM doesn't always make it faster. So you have yeah. to, based on how you use it, do I have enough RAM? Let's say your machine has 8 gigabytes of RAM in it, which is probably enough for most tasks today, um, yeah. but your machine feels really slow. What's the next thing you can do? 
Um, oh. Your gut, your gut feeling is to think about the processor, right? Yeah. It's like I need a faster engine. <laughs> Clearly, okay. It's not. It's the hard drive. Oh. Uh, and, and this is. I was thinking about that. <laughs> one thing. I mean. You're relatively young, so you maybe haven't had to do the shopping thing before, but you would have seen this um, probably four or four years ago or so would have been pretty prevalent, where if you were shopping for like a laptop, you could get a laptop that came with a, a one terabyte hard drive, or you could upgrade to a 500 gigabyte hard drive for an extra $200. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one terabyte is bigger than 500 gigabytes, right? 500 yeah. gigabytes is half of a terabyte. 512 gigabytes is half of a terabyte. Yeah. So why would I be upgrading from one terabyte to 512 gigabytes? Does that make sense? So to a layman, to somebody who's not a technology person, they might look at that and think there was a typo. Like, okay, well, well, it comes with a terabyte, but I can give you an extra 200 bucks and get half the space. That feels like a downgrade to me. You yeah. had to look at the numbers next to it. That one terabyte hard drive was probably a 5,400 RPM mechanical hard drive. Yep. The 512 gigabyte hard drive was probably a 7,200 RPM mechanical drive. So it was a drive that spun faster. Therefore, it was a faster performance drive, even though it had half the capacity. Make sense? Yep. And today, we have, we have the solution on steroids, because most drives that come in new machines now are solid state drives. No moving parts. And solid state drives are orders of magnitude faster than our mechanical drives. So if you if you have a computer that you think has a pretty good processor in it, has enough RAM, and it just feels really, really slow, if you yep. pop out the mechanical hard drive and put a solid state hard drive in, that machine will feel 50 times faster. Yep. Instantly. The, the solid state drives are, are that much faster than the mechanical drives. All right, so just kind of an interesting thing to... To consider that as human beings, we we um, we're always greedy for speed and power and things like that. Now, you know, if you're a video game player and you you know you're sitting there and you're playing games for five hours a day, well, you probably are going to want the fastest processor because you, a pretty high percentage of the time, you are using all the horsepower in your computer. But if you're somebody who's using you know has a laptop for business applications that kind of stuff. Um, and you're the one who has to pay the bill for it. I mean, if it's, a, if it's for a company and they're buying the thing, might as well get the fastest of everything that they'll pay for. But <laughs> if you're footing the bill for the thing, um, you know, get what you actually need. You know, I'm on this MacBook uh, Pro here, and you know, this one has a Core i5 processor in it instead of the Core i7 because that was less expensive. But I have maximum RAM, and I have you know the the maximum solid state hard drive. Yeah. That's what makes the machine feel fast. I am i don't game on this machine, so I'm not going to notice the difference between an i5 and an i7. You yeah. You know, 90, 99% of the time. I have an i5, too. Yep. So that makes some sense? Yep. All right. So these, a lot of times these interpreted languages, like a Python, any of these things, these guys might come out and they might let us, like, for instance, right now, one of the popular things is, like, machine learning. And Python's one of the popular languages for, for working with artificial intelligence and machine learning. And we'll talk about that stuff as well. But there are new libraries that have come out for Python specifically for doing artificial intelligence stuff that allows you to take a language that's already been around and provide it with some power tools to let you do some cool stuff that is brand new rather than having to wait and have to figure out how to, how to expand the current compiler to make this thing way, 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 way faster. So Python just says, look, we know it's going to be slower because it's uh, interpreted, but hey, guess what? Your computer's already fast, so stop uh, complaining about it. Yep. <laughs> that type of thing. All right. So we're going to be looking at Python in here, which is an interpreted language. Okay. So what is next on the docket for next week for you? Does this, uh, does this same day and time work for you next week? Yep. Okay, so what is next for you for next week? What's the next assignment that you're supposed to look at? Um, before our next meeting, um, I don't see anything for yeah. me. So it's not, but yeah, it's not popular in mine either. So we'll have to have make sure Vincent gets that uh, uh, updated. I'll reach out to him, make sure he gets that unlocked. But 
Um, and then I'll follow up with you on Slack to make sure that we're both on the same page of what you should have done next week. But make sure if you get stuck on something or you, you're, you're not making that connection where you think it wants you to actually run the program, uh, yep. reach out and say, hey, what the heck's going on? Because we definitely want to get you used to that, writing some code, saving it, running it. Okay, And you want to do that often um, so that you kind of get into that cadence of working with the command line uh, um, terminal and running your code, debugging it when you mess up, forgetting to save a file, going in, running it, and you see, oh, well, it doesn't, didn't do what I thought it just wrote because you forgot to save it. All the little mistakes that you wouldn't allow yourself to make if you're not going through that whole process every single time until it's boring. Makes sense? Okay. So I will, I'll, I'll publish the uh, video and I'll, um, it'll be under the same link. Last week I gave you the, uh, the playlist to the video. So probably in a half hour or something like this, this video will just be up there. Um, mm -hmm. And the, uh, the slides automatically update. So the link you have for the slides should be updated already. Um, and then uh, I will see you at the same time, same station next week. Yep. Okay. Well, cool. Well, I will see you then. All right. All right. Take care. Bye.